And we are live. All right. Hey, everybody, welcome. This is our fourth in the monthly installments of our virtual star parties, brought to you by the Riverside Astronomical Society in collaboration with the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of California. Uh, good morning, every, uh, good evening, sorry. My name is John Lederbach Vega. <laughs> My name is John Lederbach Vega and I'm the director for the outreach program at the Riverside Astronomical Society. And I will be a co-host for you tonight. I am not a professional astronomer by any means, but it is a hobby of mine that I've had for 30 years or so. And uh, I am broadcasting to you from my home in the city of Riverside. Sinan? Hello everyone, my name is Sinan Du, and I am in charge of the public outreach program in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at UC Riverside. Um, I have a background in astronomy and I actually got my PhD uh, two years ago. So I studied galaxy star really far away from the Milky Way. Uh, it is a great pleasure to collaborate with the Riverside Astronomical Society. Uh, and we are very excited to see that our monthly stargazing program now has reached its fourth session. So today specifically we will have a discussion on whether there's life elsewhere uh, through live telescope viewing and of course also a mini science lecture. So we'll be looking at different telescope targets that could, could potentially harbor life. So as a matter of fact, tonight we're gonna to be looking at four different areas of the sky to look at five different possible locations where we might find life. Now, if you're looking at this, joining us tonight with your phone with a little bitty screen, it might be a little frustrating because some of the images we're going to show are they're beautiful images, but they're not all that large. So if you can go to a tablet or your desktop computer or your TV flat screen up on the wall, that's what I'd suggest. The bigger the screen you can use tonight, the more happy you will be. Great. And uh, next, I will introduce our lovely volunteers tonight with us, who are mainly graduate students in astronomy from UC Riverside. They will be moderating the live chat on the right hand side on the website page that you're seeing. So they are Gary Lopez. Hello, everyone. Hope you enjoy the show tonight. Jess Doppel. Hello. Yung Da Ju. Hi, everyone and Ming Feng Ho. Hello. And finally, we have Cheryl Wilcox, uh, who's a member of uh, RAS, and she is also a middle school science teacher, and she will also be joining us um, in the live chat. Hi, everyone. So we welcome all kinds of questions and comments and encourage you to engage in discussions among yourselves. Um, most of the questions will be answered by our volunteers and the remainder will also be relayed to the panel and asked, uh, answered by us. Um, so this is the second themed stargazing and we're really excited to see some newcomers and also some returning participants. We would certainly love to collect your feedback on how we did tonight, either good or bad, um, so that we could improve our program next time based on your needs and preference. Uh, an anonymous survey will be sent to you by Eventbrite by this Saturday. So if you have been with us for a little while, you could probably tell that our program has evolved a lot and um, how your comments have been addressed. Okay, so without further ado, now I'm giving it back to John. And what I forgot to mention, typically we're in a moment, we're gonna go outside and look up at the sky. And unfortunately, we're kind of battling with some clouds here in the Riverside area. So. We're gonna do the best we can to show you live images of the, of the things we're gonna look at. Um, but if it gets too cloudy, we might have to go to archival images that we've taken with our telescopes like yesterday or last week or something. So, okay. outside now, and we're gonna, and this is what we would see right now. Um, and if we're gonna look over to the Southern part of the sky and there we will see Again, if you've been with us on earlier shows or prior months, you will see the teapot, which in astronomical terms, it's when we talk about Sagittarius, the constellation Sagittarius, we generally are actually talking about a teapot. And you can see that down here. I've circled it in the lower right part of your screen. And just to the upper left of the teapot, 
you'll see a couple of bright stars uh, right next to each other. The brightest one down to the lower right, that is the planet Jupiter, the king of our planets. And then to the left and up a little bit is that golden hued star is actually Saturn with its glorious rings. So that's where we're gonna go now. We're gonna spend some time in Sagittarius. But not actually not so much looking at the planets as really we're focusing on their moons because their moons are maybe places where there could be things living. And so we're going to check those out. So without further ado, we're going to go to Jose, who's going to talk to us about Saturn. Take it away, Jose. Yes. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jose Castro, and I am here in uh, uh, Moreno Valley, California. I'm in my backyard, and I'm also uh, an astronomer wannabe. Uh, and I'm going to share with you guys, this is an image of the planet Saturn that is going live at this very moment. We have a, a faint clouds that are passing in front of the planet and uh, it's a little bit distorted, uh, but we still can pick up a couple of the moons that we uh, are gonna be talking about. One of them being the moon Enceladus. Uh, it's, it's, it's been uh, um, theorized by scientists that Enceladus might be a moon that could uh, harvest life because it seems to have a lot of water. It is an icy moon. Uh, one of our probes uh, that went through it um, detected some nice plumes of, uh, of something. And they decided to do a little bit of um, uh, exploring there. And they found out that it was, um, hold on, I got um, my, my screen here having a little bit of, problem here. Why can I not? Let me see. Sorry about that. I lost my screen here. Um, okay. Let me, okay, let me go back here and try it again. Um, this one here. Can you guys see that? The, uh, the image of the moon of Encelado? Can we see your screen? Oh, yes. Okay, so you, you can see that, right? Okay, yes. so um, right now, what we are theorizing is that the, the, the moon Enceladus, which is covered by ice, it holds underneath a really, really vast amount of water. And they detected these plumes as the Cassini probe went by, and they did some uh, interesting discoveries about uh, different um, uh, possibilities of microorganisms that might be present there. So um, out of the uh, 79 moons that, that Saturn has, I think that Enceladus seems to be the most promising uh, place right now after Mars for us to go and explore and maybe find some kind of living organisms there because, well, you know, where there is water, there is a possibility of life. Uh, John? Great, thank you. So, Sanan, do we have any chat room activity that we need to deal with? Hi, uh, I was muted. Not yet, and uh, we welcome all kinds of questions in the in the live chat. All right, then we're going to stay up there with Sagittarius. We're going to stay up there with the land of the giant planets, and we're going to head on over to Jupiter again brighter than Saturn in our sky, easy to see with your naked eyes. You do not need binoculars or a telescope to see either of these guys. They are bright. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to leave Saturn, go to Jupiter. And again, not so much Jupiter, the planet, but the moons of Jupiter. So Manny, take it away. Thank you, John. So uh, my name is Manny Lyons. I'm coming to you from beautiful, but a little smoky Mariposa, California, a little bit west of Yosemite National Park. And uh, you can see my observatory back here. My uh, telescope is trained on Jupiter, as John mentioned. Um, I've been an amateur astronomer for a really long time, probably over 30 years. Uh, when I was a kid, when I was young, it was a given that there was uh, probably no life anywhere beyond Earth within our solar system. And wow, how things have changed. Um, I don't know if we're gonna talk about Venus, but uh, there was uh, just a recent announcement, uh, probably a week ago, about that. Perhaps one of the about uh, phosphine in Venus atmosphere. But I digress. We're here to talk about uh, Jupiter 
And so let me share my uh, share my screen. And uh, here is a live image of the planet Jupiter. So this is using uh, my 11 inch telescope uh, that is behind me here. It is uh, trained on the planet and it, it's currently uh, shooting out a new image uh, a couple of times a second right now. So you can see the cloud bands on Jupiter here. Jupiter is, uh, we call it, uh, call it the king of planets and for good reason. It is not only the largest planet uh, in our solar system, but if you took uh, all of the mass of all of the planets, moons, asteroids, comets, everything there is in the solar system and you added them all together, uh, they would not even uh, amount to half the mass of Jupiter. So uh, that's how big uh, Jupiter is. Uh, Jupiter has many, many moons as well, uh, uh, 70, over 70 of them. And uh, so right now in this view, all you can see is, uh, is the planet itself, but I'm going to adjust my camera now and I'm going to lengthen the exposure a little bit so that we can see, uh, we're, gonna, we're going to overexpose Jupiter now intentionally, but you'll begin to see some dots popping in and uh, there we have it. I'm going to widen the field of view a little bit as well. Uh, there we go, eventually. OK, I don't know that that's wider, but let me, let me see if I can make my screen a little bit bigger. OK, there we go. There we go. Yeah. So, uh, so here we have uh, three, uh, three moons now. Uh, some of you might that are familiar with the Galilean moons uh, would go, wait a minute, wait a minute, aren't there four? And uh, yes, there are. Uh, the fourth one is uh, actually right behind the planet Jupiter and it'll, it's going to pop out here probably around nine o'clock or maybe just a couple of minutes afterwards. So uh, if we're still around and there's interest, uh, perhaps we can take a look. But uh, so going from the closest to Jupiter to the farthest out, we have Io, we have uh, the planet Europa, uh, excuse me, the moon Europa, and then uh, Ganymede. And the furthest one out, interestingly enough, is Callisto. But uh, because of geometry, it happens to be uh, behind Jupiter right now. So I'm going to show you a little graphic of the, the Galilean moons. Here they are. And um, so here we have Io. Io is uh, this guy right here. And uh, it is the volcano moon. Uh, there are over 400 active volcanoes on, uh, on the moon Io. And um, it, is, uh, it whips around Jupiter, I think, about every 42 hours or so. It, it's going there, going really fast. Uh, and the reason it gets, uh, it is so hot is, uh, uh, even though it's way, way, way far away from the sun, is uh, it is being literally flexed in and out by the, the gravitational uh, pull and the tidal forces from Jupiter. And uh, just like bending a paperclip heats up the joint, uh, Io gets, uh, gets heated up internally and that's causing these, uh, these volcano, uh, um, volcanoes on the surface. Now, um, Io, I found out today while I was doing a little research, actually has the least water of any body in the solar system. So think about that. That's about the, you don't get any drier than, uh, than Io. Uh, by uh, contrast, these three moons here, uh, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, in order of their distance from Jupiter, are what we call the icy moons. And uh, they have uh, a crust of ice, and then below the surface of, the, uh, uh, of that ice, below, down under the ice, there is liquid water. And uh, uh, Europa, Europa appears to have the most uh, liquid water as far as, uh, as far as we know at this point. And uh, that liquid water, uh, we know that liquid water and, uh, and heat, energy, the two of those together and some organics uh, are very successful in producing life here on Earth. And uh, on Earth, we have, uh, we have these organisms that are called collectively extremophiles. Uh, they're uh, 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 organisms that can live in extreme environments. And um, Europa would certainly be one of those. So if you can think of, perhaps there are hydrothermal vents under Europa, uh, the surface, like there are on, uh, on Earth. Uh, maybe we have giant 20-foot tube worms uh, <laughs> on, uh, on Europa. That would be both... Uh, exciting and terrifying at the same time. So, um, but we don't know. 
Uh, thankfully, we have uh, some space missions that are going to these, uh, these icy moons soon. Uh, there are two missions in particular. Uh, let me see if I can flip to the next slide. Okay, here we go. So two missions, the NASA mission, the Europa Clipper here in uh, the year 2025. So just about five years from now, uh, it should be launching on a uh, space launch system uh, rocket, the uh, ultra heavy rocket that NASA is developing now. It will get to, uh, the, the, uh, to Jupiter in about two years and it will be put into a looping orbit that goes around Jupiter and then whizzes by Europa uh, 45 times and then goes up through this orbit around Jupiter and then back around uh, Europa again and again and again. And it'll be taking lots of data. One of the most exciting things is recently there's been a discovery of water plumes, uh, liquid water coming off the surface of Europa. And there is the potential that the Europa Clipper could literally fly through those plumes and sniff them for organic materials. So that would be very exciting. Uh, the second mission that is going to the Jovian system is JUICE, which is the Jupiter icy moons explorer, I think it is. That's the European Space Station Agency mission. It's going to, uh, launch a little bit sooner in 2022, but it will get there later because it's going on a not uh, quite so powerful rocket. So uh, probably we're looking at uh, 2029 or so before um, the JUICE orbiter arrives. Now JUICE will be orbiting the, the moon Ganymede. And so Ganymede, the one that's, that's uh, not visible to us right now, Ganymede also has, um, has liquid water, we're quite sure, below the ice. So uh, the interesting thing, exciting thing is uh, that um, the JUICE orbiter will spend quite a bit of time around Ganymede and be able to take long-term uh, data, images, et cetera, there. But it'll also be able to look at the other icy moons and gain uh, uh, some knowledge about them as well. So uh, very, very exciting uh, things ahead in the next uh, few years with respect to the search for life around Jupiter. Take it away, John. Awesome. Thank you, Manny. That was great. Okay, now we're going to go outside again. And we're going to, you know, as I mentioned, hold on a second. John, we do have a good um, question in the chat. Oh, do you want and I forgot. Know? I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, so this question comes from uh, Angeli Ravilla. Um, so the question is, what are you using to show us images live from the telescope? Ah, okay. I have a, um, I have a cooled astronomical camera, which uh, I, I'm not sure that you could see it. It's actually right back here, this little uh, red cylinder here. Uh, it, is, it is like a, um, a, a single digital single lens reflex camera, but it is cooled about 30 degrees below ambient temperature, which uh, means that it has less noise. And um, it also doesn't have a mechanical shutter. It has an electronic shutter and a few other differences that may, that optimize it for uh, uh, astronomical use. Great. Thank you, Manny. Anything else from the chat room? Uh, no, that was the, the one so far. All right, now here I go. Okay, so we're going to go outside again. And like I mentioned to you of a few minutes ago, that you, when you're looking up over in the, by Sagittarius in the south sky, the southwestern sky, you can see Jupiter and Saturn very easily just with your naked eye. You do not need any sort of optical aid. Now we're going to go over to the eastern sky and we're going to look in the constellation Pisces, the fish. And Pisces to me is certainly not one of my favorite constellations. It's not very easy to find. It's uh, not very easy, you know, not really any bright stars, but it's got this sort of big V, one fish, fish, red fish, blue fish, but it's got this big V, right? And that's where Pisces is. And the reason we're talking about Pisces is because that is where we will find the planet Mars. So if you look low in the eastern sky now, you'll see a very bright star, which is even you know, brighter than Jupiter. And that is the planet Mars. 
and you'll see pretty much right away why they call it the red planet is clearly has a red maybe orange color to it that makes it stand out from the, all the other stars around it so not only is it brighter than anything else up there it has this beautiful red color again you do not need binoculars you do not need a telescope and mars is going to be with us for months now so it's not just going to be around for the next few weeks it'll definitely be with us for the next few months so go outside look at it check it out and since we are talking about mars we're going to go back to Jose, who was done showing Saturn, and now he's going to go looking at Mars. And Ace, we're not looking at the moons of Mars. We're looking at the planet itself as a place where maybe life could be. Jose, take it away. Okay. Um, well, unfortunately, I have no clear view of the planet Mars. It's been clouded out, so the screen camera is a little bit fuzzy. And basically, it just doesn't show much. Um, but I can tell you this. Um, we're looking at a planet that's around 38 million miles right now. It just uh, had the closest approach to Earth that it's going to have like in 13 years, just a couple of days ago. And this coming up week, we're going to have uh, opposition. That's the reason why the planet Mars um, looks, uh, looks red. Okay. Okay. Um, it, it looks um, really bright, almost as bright as a planet Jupiter. And um, I'm going to share some information here since I don't have a clear view of the planet Mars. Uh, okay. Let me see if you can see that. Uh, let me close these over here. And we have uh, a few things that... Uh, the planet is uh, interesting for, like, uh, for example, it is a really small planet. But then again, uh, it, it has come up to, I think that a, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, it was around 32 million miles close to, uh, to us. And now it's about 38. And that's the closest it's going to be in a few years. It is also the fourth planet uh, on the solar system. Uh, it takes uh, uh, a little bit longer than the 24 hours that um, uh, takes on Earth for a day, uh, but it takes uh, about uh, 687 times uh, or days uh, for the planet to go around the, the sun. Uh, it is a very rugged terrain uh, planet. It is very rocky. Uh, it has a, a surface that has been altered by volcanoes, impacts, uh, winds, uh, it, it uh, also has a really thin atmosphere. So you need to bring a spacesuit to that planet if you ever decide to visit. You cannot go over there and decide like, ah, oh, it's, it's so fresh, the air, because you're going to be breathing carbon dioxide, argon, nitrogen, and a small amount of oxygen that is going to probably try to uh, uh, extend your agony there. Um, we have a planet that has two moons, two small moons. It has a Phobos and Deimos. Uh, obviously, it does not have rings uh, like the other planets do, like the gas giants do. Uh, we have many, many missions that have gone uh, over to explore and, and ex uh, you know, take images. And right now, we have Curiosity and uh, Perseverance, uh, Perseverance that is going up there. Uh, trying to study, and we have found out that there is uh, water uh, that had been uh, frozen underneath uh, uh, the terrain, the, the surface, and also at the poles. Uh, we can actually see with our telescope, we can actually get to see those uh, polar uh, ice caps. Um, it is a really tough place. Don't believe the hype about the, the movie uh, The Martian because it is really tough for anybody to uh, to make a living there. And also, uh, you probably ask yourself, why is it called uh, the red planet or the rusty planet? And it's because uh, there is a lot of uh, um, oxidized soil on the surface of it, causing the, the soil, also sometimes because of the winds and the storms there, uh, to create a British atmosphere. Uh, so uh, I hope that you uh, like those um, those views uh, over here. You can actually see on this uh, image here, you can see one of the polar ice caps. And that whiteness uh, that you see there is uh, ice water uh, frozen. Uh, 
uh, as you can see, uh, you can do some of roading, which John and I enjoy uh, sometimes, uh, but I don't think that you'll get any parts soon enough. Uh, we get a couple of views of the horizon there from uh, one of the rovers, and you can see one of the little rovers uh, machines, the robots, uh, on the surface of the planet. There you go. Uh, John, uh, I'll give it back to you. All right. Thank you, Jose. All right. So now at this point, we've been talking about maybe possible locations for life in the past within our solar system. But most of the possibilities, most in terms, certainly in terms of numerically, is if we look at outside of our solar system to the world of exoplanets, which there might be billions of exoplanets that'll be much like Earth in our galaxy. So to tell us more about the exoplanets and looking for life that's not or the planets that are not too hot or not too cold, not too big, not too small. Things looking just right for life. Let's have Franco talk to us about that. Franco, take it away. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, John. Let me go ahead and share my screen real quick and we'll get started. Let me move this here, present. And can everyone see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. Well, like I said before, thank you so much, John, uh, for the great introduction. As you guys know, my name is Franco Iglesias. I am a graduate student at Cal State LA. And today we will be looking into habitable worlds in our galaxy. We will be looking into what makes them habitable and what we are doing to look for habitable worlds and civilizations outside of Earth. I would like to give a quick shout out to Professor Stephen Kane from UCR because without his summer research class, I would not have the experience of all the cool things that we, are, that we will be talking about today. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So a great place to start would be to ask the question, how likely is it to find life in the universe? For that, we have a wonderful equation called the Drake Equation that gives us a general idea, an estimate as to how many civilizations are in a galaxy. Variables like how many stars can form in the galaxy and how many planets can hold liquid water and a bunch of other variables are multiplied together to give us a percentage of the chances of finding life. And while the number after being multiplied out is very, very small, very small chance, when you multiply it, like they mentioned before, by the billions and billions and billions of possible planets in our galaxy, the odds actually become very probable. Of course, this is just an estimate. Like I said before, there's no real guarantee to this number. However, it does definitely set up our understanding of what to look for. And with that, we're going to shift from theoretical to more observational things that we can do to look for life. So now let's start talking about what kind of star is the planet orbiting. The best kind of stars that have the best chance for life typically are stars in the main sequence. Not too big like your super giants and giants over here, and not too small like your red, white, and, and, uh, red, white, and brown dwarfs. We also want a star that has a long lifetime rather than just a couple of, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. We want a star that can live for billions and billions of years, like our sun. Our sun is a main sequence star right in the middle that's currently roughly 5 billion years old. We also want a star that has plenty of heavier elements like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. These elements are very, very important for life and currently we don't know if life can exist without them. All right, it's very important to note that most stars are not alone. Most stars typically have a buddy or two that orbit each other in what's called a multi-star system. We aren't too sure yet if multi-star systems have better or worse chances of having life since more research needs to be done. But multi-star systems do introduce a level of instability for planets that orbit multi-star systems. All right, next we will jump into how far away a planet is from its star. The habitable zone, also known as the Goldilocks zone, is a space in between not too far and not too close to the host star. This allows for liquid surface water to exist on the planet. Liquid surface water is very, very important to discovering life since Earth 
the only planet that we know that has life, also has liquid surface water. Now, typically, the brighter the star, the wider and farther away the habitable zone will be. And this habitable zone does evolve over time. Mars will be in the sun's new habitable zone in a couple of billion years, where, as Earth, will be much too close to the sun to sustain life. All right, jumping into the next slide. Now we have what kind of planet or moon, emphasis there, is best for life. Most planets have some sort of energy source, either it being solar energy from the star, the internal heating of the planet, in, I'm sorry, rather inside the planet, or both. The moons of Jupiter, as we talked about earlier, mostly get their energy from the internal heating caused by the gravitational tugging of the planet Jupiter and the other moons near its orbit. Uh, again, I believe Mendy was the one that talked about that earlier. We also care if the planet is gaseous planet like Jupiter or a rocky planet like Earth. Rocky planets like Earth and Mars have a greater chance since they have a surface, an actual surface for life to exist on. While unfortunately gas planets, well, the name is in the, is in the title, they're gaseous. They're almost entirely filled with gas and they don't have a surface. However, this isn't the end of the world because, like they talked about before, the moons are possible habitable zones that orbit these giant gas planets. Lastly, an atmosphere and a magnetic field, they two come typically in a pair, are great things to look for when looking for a, a habitable world. Although it's not the end of the world if a planet doesn't have an atmosphere. The moon Europa of Jupiter doesn't have a thick atmosphere, but instead has an underground ocean like we talked about earlier, where life can exist underneath the crust of said moon. All right, lastly, let's talk about what we have been doing to look for life, starting with the easiest, looking for water. As mentioned before, water is a great, great indicator for life. And we already know some objects in our solar system that have possible underground water like Europa, Enceladus, and even just recently announced, I believe two weeks ago, Mars having underground lakes. Another way to look for life is to look for basic forms of life and what they give off. Just recently, again, I know we're getting a bunch of news like in the past month or so, Venus, of all planets, was discovered to have a compound called phosphine gas, which is a great indicator for small basic life. Although, don't get too riled up yet, a lot more research needs to go into Venus before we declare we found life on Venus. Uh, finally, the organization SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, are dedicated to looking for not basic, but intelligent life. Using radio telescopes like this one here, Arecibo in Puerto Rico, they were able to send a coded message to a globular cluster, which is just a bunch of stars grouped up together, to see if there's any intelligent life there. NASA themselves have also sent golden record disks on board of Voyager, a satellite that we sent outside, to see if anyone runs into them and if they're willing to decode it. All right, that concludes this presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed that. And now I will hand the mic right back to John. Great, thank you, Franco. That was terrific. All right, oops. Whoa. Okay, so. I was negligent before when we were talking about Mars and such to stop and ask for questions from our chat room that we can address. So Sunan, what do we have? Uh, we actually have a lot of questions and I think this is, awesome. which, uh, this is a, a great place to, to answer them. So a uh, question from Wondering Teacup. Did Mars ever have a thicker atmosphere? If yes, uh, do, uh, is there a theory on what happened to it? I can take that one if uh, no one else wants to. Go ahead, Frank. Go for it. Yeah, so Mars, much, much earlier in, uh, in the universe's life, is predicted to have had some sort of atmosphere. But when we take a look at Mars, Mars's size is rather small, which means its core is also rather small. And so due to the fact that it lost a lot of its internal heating, the magnetic field that would have encapsulated this wonderful atmosphere, unfortunately, would have been eroded away by the solar winds of our sun. Now we see Mars as it is today, uh, but earlier, you're, you're right, it could have possibly had an atmosphere, but unfortunately, we're left with the red, rusty planet. 
Great, thank you, Franco. And uh, another question uh, from Peregrine Anderson. Why are we searching for cooler planets rather than warmer planets? Well, I guess uh, here's a, like a relative sense, uh, cooler and warmer. Well, I can take that one if, uh, I mean, or I could uh, just comment on that. I guess we're not necessarily trying to find cooler planets. We want to find it uh, not too cool and not too hot. Uh, so liquid water can at least survive on the surface. I mean, of course, that's um, only what we expect or speculate what uh, kind of planet would be habitable only based on uh, what we have on Earth, right? So we have oceans uh, covering up over 70% of the surface of the Earth. But life might exist also in other conditions that are completely different from Earth's condition. Say they might survive in um, uh, subsurface water or maybe the liquid media is not even water. Um, so I guess so far, based on our understanding of Earth and life, which is ourselves, we're trying to find uh, a planet that is sort of in the middle, uh, where not too hot, not too cold, uh, where liquid water can survive on the surface of the, that planet. Okay, uh, well, moving on, uh, we have Iqbo Pirawala asking, uh, I was told that Mars will be uh, closest to Earth on October 6th and at opposition on October 13th. What does in opposition mean? Oh, I'll take that one. So opposition. So we are orbiting around the sun on Earth. Mars is orbiting around the sun as well. And sometimes from our point of view on Earth, when we look up in the sky, we can see Mars and it might be right next to the sun, which makes it really hard to see Mars. Or we might be at the opposite ends. So as, as we're watching the sun set over in the east, we might be watching Mars rise. Well, other way around. Watching the sun set in the west, we might see Mars rise in the east. There is an opposite ends of the sky. And that is opposition. So then when Mars is in opposition, it'll be up in the nighttime sky all night long. Great. Thank you, John. Um, and one question about Jupiter. Uh, this is again from Wonder and Teacup. Um, so the question is, doesn't Jupiter have a bigger radiation belt? Uh, would the icy layer be enough to protect any potential life? Yeah, I, I could take that one. So uh, Jupiter does in fact have very intense uh, radiation. Uh, I think some of the most intense radiation of anywhere within the solar system, uh, except perhaps the surface of the sun. But in any event, uh, so there are a number of things. First of all, um, you, I mentioned earlier about the fact that the spacecraft uh, will not be orbiting uh, Europa. The Europa Clipper will, in fact, be looping around Europa and Jupiter. And part of the reason for that is that uh, Europa is in one of the most uh, intense regions of, uh, of uh, radiation around Jupiter. And so we don't want to hang around there for very long. We kind of zip through, take some pictures, sniff some atmosphere, and then get out of there, uh, send the data back to Earth, and then come back again for another lap. Your question was uh, the poss possibility of life under the surface. Uh, and yes, actually water uh, does a great job of, uh, of uh, slowing down and uh, absorbing uh, many radiation particles. And as a matter of fact, uh, that's why on the space station uh, and, and uh, other spacecraft and deep space missions, uh, the, the astronauts will have a shelter where they will be surrounded by, uh, by all the water they're carrying with them uh, basically as a radiation shield. So uh, if we know that there's a solar flare coming, we can retreat to that area. So if there's life at the bottom of the quote unquote ocean on Europa, uh, they may have uh, thousands of feet of water above them, which would uh, uh, probably do a pretty good job of uh, protecting the life from uh, the radiation effects. CNN, may I share my screen for a moment? Stan? Oh. Yeah, totally. Go ahead. Alex. I'd like to return to um, the question about opposition. Uh, and is my screen being shared now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, 
I have a presentation I have to give tomorrow that is of interest to people that uh, would, would help us answer some questions here tonight. Um, you have to understand that at all times, we're all going around. And as you can see, the earth is sometimes like a word opposition to certain things. Let me go on to the next slide here. Uh, there than two slides from now. This is the position of the sun, the earth, and Mars right about now as we all circle around here. And remember when we were looking, when we were looking from here at Jupiter, it was off to the right. And now the, the Mars, one of the reasons Jose was having a tough time getting it, well, besides the clouds, was that it was just rising above the, um, just rising above the horizon. Well, remember the sun has just set uh, on the other horizon. See, that there's a line between us and it. And uh, what is this, Uranus out here and Neptune out here? Uh, uh, Neptune is also at opposition. It is opposite the sun from us. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alex. John, now giving back to you. All right, we're gonna go outside again and look up in the sky and not we're not looking to the eastern sky, we're not looking to the western sky or the southern sky, we're looking straight up. And if you were with us in prior editions of our, of our presentation, this will be familiar to you. We're gonna go back up and look for the summer triangle. So again, one of the bright the stars in the sky, you go out there unless it's cloudy. You look up in the sky, one of the brightest things high overhead is Vega in the constellation Lyra. And if you take a, uh, take a, go from Vega to Cygnus the Swan, which we talked about before, the tail feathers of Cygnus the Swan, well, that's Deneb. And then you go way down here to Altair, which is part of the constellation Aquila, the Eagle, and then connect back over to Vega. You've created the Summer Triangle which is one of those things you can go out and just find tonight. No, no binoculars needed. And the reason I bring up the summer triangle is inside the summer triangle is the constellation Volpecula. And Volpecula is where we're going to go next because that's where our guest star, Bob Massey, is going to show us how we go hunting for an exoplanet. Bob, take it away. Okay, thank you. And let me just bring up my screen can you all see my screen not yet hmm. oh well you know what i know why there's one more button okay there, there we goes. go <laughs> all right we're up you click on the screen and then you have to click on one more button all right. Uh, thank you, John. Um, my name is Bob Massey. Uh, like the others, I'm a longtime uh, amateur astronomer, member of the Riverside Astronomical Society, and uh, I'm coming to you tonight from uh, my home in uh, Palm Desert, California, which is just on the other side of the mountains from Riverside. And tonight I want to talk to you very quickly. Um, a lot of material to cover about observing exoplanets. Uh, Franco gave you a great reason why we're interested in them because we think there's a good possibility there may be life on some of them. And we also think there may be many, many, many of them. And uh, John has just given you a quick tour of the sky in the area of Volpecula. And we're going to tonight look at a particular exoplanet. It's called uh, HD 189733B. Doesn't mean much to you, I'm sure, right now, but I'll tell you a little more about that particular star and its uh, exoplanet in a, in a few seconds. Uh, the first thing, though, uh, I do want to talk to you about is give you an idea of uh, how do we uh, detect exoplanets. Um, there are several methods of doing it, and we don't have time to describe every one of them, but I'll talk about two of them in particular. Uh, the first one being direct imaging. Um, that's probably the most obvious, but it's not the most prevalent. Uh, direct imaging obviously involves looking at the star and looking for a planet around it. Sounds pretty simple, but it's not all that easy. Uh, in our diagram right here, there's a little black dot here 
this is covering the star. The actual star is all the way around here. And by blocking that out with special equipment, uh, the professionals have, we can actually see these, there's actually four stars, one, two, I'm sorry, four planets, one, two, three, and four uh, orbiting this, this star. Now that sounds like, hey, no big deal. We can uh, easily uh, observe planets uh, in this method. The problem is uh, it's very difficult because the stars are very bright the planets do not emit light of their own. They only reflect the light of the star. And the planets, relatively speaking, are incredibly close to the star. Uh, the, about the only way we can see them better is if they're further away. But then we get into a thing called the inverse square law, meaning that if a, star, if a planet is twice as far away as one that's in close, it's going to have to be the... Uh, four times brighter. And that doesn't happen because you're getting further and further away from uh, the, the sun or it, or the basic uh, star. Uh, a good example that, that I've, uh, of how difficult this is that I've heard is if you think of the big searchlights that are at auto malls and so forth. And if you come up near one and you can see all kinds of little flies flitting around that searchlight. All, uh, back and forth. Pretty easy to see if you're right on top of that searchlight. Now put that searchlight on a big hill and go about 200 miles away and look at that searchlight. And you're probably not going to see those flies or those insects flying around there. That's why it's very difficult. As of six o'clock this morning, there were 4,284 confirmed exoplanets that we know of. Of those, only 51 of them have been discovered using direct imaging. So what do we do if that's the case? Well, the most prevalent method is called the transit method. And this is similar to eclipsing. Uh, if uh, we're all familiar with how the, uh, the Earth, or I'm sorry, the moon gets between us and the sun and eclipses the sun and it gets dark, right? Well, that same concept is called a transit. And what happens basically is that as a planet goes around its host star, and if we're looking at that star, we have a certain brightness, but if you look in the lower left-hand corner, as it goes around, the brightness dips. And by that dip and several other things that we have to consider, uh, we can determine that there's an exoplanet revolving around that star. Now, once again, like, just like direct imaging, this is very difficult to do because um, the planet is very, very small. And as a result of it being extremely small, uh, the dip in the brightness of the star is, is minuscule. It's probably about one ten thousandths of the star's overall brightness. So it takes very sensitive equipment uh, to be able to uh, determine the, the brightness. So the method we're going to use tonight that we're going to show that even us amateurs can use is called this transit method. And in comparison to direct imaging of those 4,200 plus uh, exoplanets that have been discovered so far, over 3,300 of them have been discovered using the transit method. Tonight, we're gonna to look at HD 189733. This is the star right here. HD stands for uh, Henry Draper. Uh, that's a catalog. Uh, it's a catalog that was named after, after him. And it was created uh, back in the early 20th century, uh, approximately 200,000 stars, of which this is 189,733, and it's up in Volpecula. It's very close to us. It's only 65 light years away from us, which is considered very close. Um, it's about three quarters the radius of our sun. So uh, on the right is in, in the relationship here is our sun, and to the left is HD 189733. 
So it's it's similar to our sun. So theoretically, it should be to uh, from Franco's discussion, uh, it might host uh, habitable uh, uh, planets. So let's see if it it does. Now our actual target is going to be the the B designator in the one eight nine seven three three, and that's uh, this little blue globe here. This is obviously an artist. Uh, illustration because there's no way we could see this this closely and it's what what's called a Jupiter star size star uh, I'm sorry size planet and uh, by comparison it's about 13 percent larger than our planet Jupiter it's known as a hot Jupiter and the reason it's known as a hot Jupiter Jupiter as you know orbits relatively far away from um, our sun. But in the case of this particular planet, it is orbiting, and I apologize for this slide, I couldn't get a, a, a closer uh, or a better image of it, but here in the center here is, is our host star, and this little circle right here is the orbit of this Jupiter hot Jupiter uh, planet. It orbits every 2.22 days around the planet. So think about that for a second, every two days. And by comparison, if our sun was in this position, here's the orbit of Mercury. Here's the uh, orbit of the Earth. And here is the orbit of Mars. Whoops, went one slide too fast here. And this little green area is uh, what uh, Franco re referred to earlier is the habitable zone for this planet. So for all practical purposes, based on everything we know about what we think life might be like, even in extreme forms, this is probably not going to be a planet itself that may host um, uh, any, any uh, life because it's well within the habitable zone. But again, we don't know for sure. And there could be some moons or something uh, orbiting around it. So that's what our target is for tonight. Um, we're going to go out to our uh, Riverside Astronomical Society's uh, dark sky site. And uh, we certainly uh, hope to have you come out sometime soon when the, the conditions are better, the COVID conditions and so forth. Here's a telescope we're using, and um, this telescope is a 14-inch telescope. It's a reflecting telescope. The mirror is down here. The light, I'm sorry, the, <laughs> the mirror is down here, and the light enters up through here. And the camera is, is down here, similar to Manny's camera. It's a CCD camera, and uh, we're going to be imaging th through this. So let's play a little uh, game here. Um, I'm going to call Spot the Planet. All right, now we can't show you, I mean, I can show you a live image, but I can't show you an actual transit because the transit takes about um, just under two hours and we certainly don't have that kind of time. But we do have uh, uh, 400 images here and I'm gonna go through them in a time-lapse very fast. And our HD 189733 is right here. So I want you to keep your eye on this as we go through this. Yeah, we're moving. And we're gonna go through about 410 images here. And tell me if you can spot the planet going around it. Remember, you're, you're looking for a dip of about, dip of about one ten thousandths of, of the brightness of that star. There we go. I'll zoom in a little bit, show you uh, the shape of the star. Now I'll zoom back out. This uh, series of images actually ran for about four hours from about uh, 940 in the evening until about 130 in the morning. And the actual transit occurred around 1030 till about midnight uh, 30. And if you'll notice, there's a lot of activity going on here. The star is getting brighter, uh, fainter, um, kind of coming in focus and out focus. And that's just an artifact of the atmosphere that we have to deal with. So 
we take those 400 uh, and 10 images. And now the next thing we're going to do is, let me get through here, is plot our transit. And I'm going to switch. Uh, objects here. This time I'm going to hit both the buttons. And are you all seeing a graph right now? Or a plot? Yes. Okay, yep. great. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we can't really see the, the planet, but we can infer its existence. So on the left hand side, I just have a scale. And right here at one, we're going to use that as a baseline. And we're going to say, this is the point at which the star is at its full brightness before the, there's an actual transit. Along the bottom here is the time frame from the beginning to the end. And you'll see here it says predicted ingress and predicted egress. And these little vertical lines, and they'll go shoot up here in a second. But this tells us where the transit should occur. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to plot those 410 brightness amounts. And as you can see here, we do have some kind of a dip here, but it's a, you know, it's it, it's not great. It goes all over the place. So one of the reasons it's going around a lot is if going down at the very bottom, remember we talked about how everything was moving around, the, the, it was getting bigger and smaller. Well, we need to compare apples to apples. So one, one, uh, um, uh, one frame to the, to the next in, in order to be, be able to make sure everything looks, looks the same and we can make the same type of measurements. So we do a, a little thing called detrending. Now, I'm not going to go into what all these little wiggly lines mean. The, the most obvious one here, this green line that's kind of a semicircle, is actually the air mass. As the star goes through the sky and our telescope is pointing at it, we're gonna, it's going to go through more or less air depending on how much, you know, where it is in the sky, how high it is in the sky, and that affects how bright that star is. And we want to rule all that out. So the next thing we do is we use a software called Astro Image J, or I use a software called Astro Image J, and it goes through there and it smooths out and takes all that information out of there. And as Bob, you sorry, yeah. but I don't think we are seeing your, your cursor. Um, and it's... Uh, You're well, not seeing it here well, now? No, and there, there are also no light curves. Really? Oh. Oh, wait a minute. It says your screen sharing is paused. Why is that? Um, would you would, would you like to to try again, or maybe just uh, quickly? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stop share and and uh, share again. Thanks for telling okay. me. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. And maybe we just directly jump into the, the end re result of the light curve, maybe? <laughs> sure. Yes, I know. I'm, I realize I'm running a little long here. OK, do you see it all now? Not yet. There we go. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, I apologize. Uh, here, here's our raw data. Here's the data, what we call detrending. We subtract things like uh, the, the air mass, turbulence in the air, and so forth. And then the last thing we apply to it is modeling. We know certain characteristics of that star, its temperature, its size, and we know certain characteristics of the uh, planet itself, its size, its mass, and so forth. And so here's our curve. And so this is the tr transit line. This is where it ends. And down through here is, is a full transit. Now, we could say that, gee, this was just by happenstance and it was just the atmosphere that caused all this to dip like this over this three or four hour period. Well, that's why we have something called comp stars or comparison stars. And if the, these are other stars that were in the same time frame, as you see, they don't dip. So they're in the same image or that same frame and they're not changing and they're not dipping. So I'm going to switch back to my original presentation and end. You can see that again. 
Yes. Okay. So I apologize for running a little bit long. It's a lot to cover in there, but the, the, the point is that as an amateur, you can participate and uh, if you have a telescope and you too can uh, Im image uh, exoplanets. They're not that hard to do. Uh, here's two quick resources. Uh, if you're new to this whole idea, excellent NASA JPL site, Exoplanet Watch. Uh, they have a program uh, where they have software and uh, take you through the whole thing and, and allow you to uh, look at exoplanets. If you're a little more advanced or want to get a little more advanced, I highly recommend the American Association of Variable Star Observers. They have a lot of material and courses on exoplanets. And I apologize for taking so long, but there you go. Back, back to you, John. Um, that was great. Okay, now, do we have any questions coming out of the chat room for us? Yes, we do. And uh, before that, I also want to mention if you're interested in uh, any of the, the website or resources Bob just shared, uh, they're also posted in the YouTube comment section. So you can directly click on the link. Um, and we have a question from Alessandro, and this is a reoccurring question. Is Mars ice drinkable? Oh, I don't mind answering that one. Oh. Okay, go ahead, Franco. Sorry. So uh, from what we've gathered, I believe this, the water on Mars is extremely, extremely salty, in fact. It's not the uh, best cup of Arrowhead drinkable water. It's very, very salty, very, very um, not pure just water. So I do not recommend uh, drinking anything from Mars until a scientist cleans it up a little bit or, or something. It's very salty. And adding on to that, um, so I don't know what you mean by Mars ice, but if you're talking about the solar caps that you typically see, you know, um, like ice on uh, Martian uh, poles, they are mainly uh, carbon dioxide, frozen carbon dioxide instead of uh, water ice. So um, it's, there are seasonal variations during summer um, it just gets back uh, to gaseous state um, to the atmosphere. So they are not necessarily um, water ice, but they are carbon dioxide ice, or as we normally refer it as dry ice. Um, so our next question is from Kelvin F. Uh, the diagram Franco showed um, says, Jupiter has a lot of metallic hydrogen. What is metallic hydrogen and how is it different from normal hydrogen atoms? I can take care of that. Um, hydrogen, it, it, the atom in, a, uh, in metallic hydrogen is the same atom that you would find in gaseous um, uh, hydrogen. Um, but when atoms get together, they coalesce into different shapes depending on what temperature and what pressure they're under. Uh, for instance, we just talked about ice on Mars. Can you drink it? No, you can't drink any ice because it's a solid. All right, that means that it's held in a very strict, uh, well, in a usually strict crystalline matter. And, and there's a very, all the bonds between the atoms are rather tight. If you warm up water a little bit, you'll get to um, a hydrogen, or you're, if you get warm up water a little bit, you'll get to a liquid. And in liquid, the molecules are the same, but they can flow back and forth and the, and the molecules or atoms are not as attached to each other with links in between them, forming a specific, particular shape. In gaseous, they are so far apart that they, they are floating completely separate from each other. Metallic is not in itself a state of matter as liquid, solid, and gaseous is. Um, but um, with metallic, uh, something that's metallic doesn't necessarily form a crystalline structure. Uh, the bonds between them, between the atoms are not so strict that they, that they can't flex as much. And uh, under the, in the center of uh, Jupiter, um, there is so much pressure pushing the hydrogen atoms together that they act like a metal. They're relatively harder, but they aren't so hard as to form a 
crystalline structure, which would make them a solid. That's it. Great, thank you, Alex. And uh, another question from Marisol Stokes. Um, can you please point out the Big Dipper? My first grade students are watching tonight. So we learned about it in our mystery science lessons today. Um, so John, maybe uh, we could point out yeah. that uh, sure. while we're introducing the, the next constellation. Yeah, let me go, let's go outside. And now the Big Dipper is in the Northern sky. So we're gonna spin the sky around a little bit. Now, let me get my little drawing tool out here. The Big Dipper is, is one of the things that's cool about the Big Dipper. It is always up in the sky. When you live here in, in the United States, you can always find the Big Dipper. Eh, sometimes it's down low in the sky, so it might be behind a mountain or behind somebody's house or some trees. But it, has never, it never sets. So the Big Dipper, we look right now, it would be low in the northern sky. Big Dipper's got a handle, right? So we go here, down here, and then the Big Dipper's got a bowl, down here, like that. And now the Big Dipper, like in the early evening, will be in one place, like a few hours from now, it'll be higher in the sky. It has certain seasons during the year when the Big Dipper's easy to find because it's high in the sky, like after dinner, before we go to bed. Um, other times, after dinner, before we go to bed, it's low in the sky, so it's hard to find. But that is the Big Dipper. And one of the coolest things about the Big Dipper is once you can find that, you find a bowl here and the bowl points up, 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 to the North Star. And the North Star never moves. So once we find the Big Dipper, it'll show you where the North Star is. And once you find the North Star, you can always find it again because it's never gonna move. But the North Star is not very bright. A lot of people think it's so famous. It must be very bright, but it's not. You can barely see it from a city. But I hope that helps. Great. Thank you, John. Um, and that's the question uh, we have so far. OK, so now we're going to go back outside. And this time, we're going to continue looking over into the eastern sky. So let me rotate our sky here. And there. Again, as we've talked about in the past, in some of our earlier episodes of our, of our astronomy show, we find the great square of Pegasus. It is one of the asterisms, groupings of stars in the sky that's fairly easy to find. And if you take from there, there's sort of a trail of stars that come out here, come up here, and that will take you right to where our next target is that Randy's gonna show us, a globular cluster known as Messier 15. Take it away, Randy. Okay, thank you very much, John. Uh, I'm gonna hit the share of the screen and hopefully everything is working. Uh, be nice if somebody tells me if there is sound or not. First of all, here's a picture of uh, M15, it's a 15th object on Messier's catalog when he's looking for comets. And this is a globular cluster. Uh, believe it or not, you're looking at over 100,000 stars all put together. The reason we're using this as a, as a target is because uh, globular clusters, which there are uh, about 150 or so of them around uh, are in our galaxy, are stars that are very, very close together. The very center of this thing has 30,000 stars within about 20 or 22 light years apart, which means if you wanted to find a bunch of exoplanets, that would be the place that you might think would be a great place to go because the stars are very, very close together. Or if you wanted to uh, talk to somebody who happened to have developed a radio like you, uh, that would also be a good place to talk to. However, globular clusters are one of those good news, bad news type of things. They are unfortunately some of the oldest stars in our galaxy. They were formed so long ago that uh, there were not very much in the way of heavy elements other than hydrogen and helium, maybe a few other uh, miscellaneous things. But they didn't have a lot of the heavy elements like the metals and uh, other uh, elements to make rock and that sort of stuff. So 
in that regard, they're probably poor places to look for uh, life. On the other hand, you also see, which is very unusual, uh, stars that have formed inside of these since they were uh, the globular was uh, originally formed, and they're newer stars, which means that there's some stellar evolution that has taken place. So that would give a good reason uh, there might be life there. Uh, they showed Arecibo a while back, uh, talking about the radio astronomers sent um, a message uh, to uh, M13, the globular cluster, in hopes that we might match up with somebody here. Let me play this, it's very short. It might clarify this better than what I just did, but here's a short video. It's only a portion of it, but here Not it have had a chance to evolve there in the first place. You hear the sound. Not only are the stars in globular clusters very old, they don't contain as many metals as our sun does. Planets are born from the leftovers of star formations. Inside a globular cluster, there might not be enough building materials for a rocky planet like Earth to be formed. Even our sun might have had trouble forming in those conditions, but if it did, it would most likely have a stellar partner. Binary star systems aren't unusual in the universe, but they are less likely to host habitable planets that we could live on. Another problem is that globular clusters are very, very dense chances would be high that an alien star would collide with our sun one day. But let's imagine that we were very lucky, that our sun formed inside a globular cluster, and so did our planet. Imagine that the conditions on that Earth were somewhat habitable for us to evolve in, and that we did. But it wouldn't be the same us. We'd have to get by without most of the metals available to us here. How would we create our first tools? build our homes, or invent our tech. We might be stuck in the Stone Age forever, but at least we'd have an incredible view of thousands of very bright stars shining down on our planet. On the other hand, if we figured out how to make rockets out of rocks, the extremely short distances between the stars would let us colonize other star systems fairly easily. Space travel would be our main gig. We'd settle on other planets and spread our human civilization all over the globular cluster that we lived in. That is, if there were other planets to travel to. Scientists don't know for sure how many planets could form in these clusters, and they don't know if life is actually possible inside the stellar swarm. But they are looking for signs of intelligent life out there. I, for one, hope they find an ancient alien civilization inhabiting one of the oldest star systems in our galaxy. But that's a story for another What If. Okay, and just to round things off, here is another globular cluster. This is M2. Uh, it's a little bit larger than the one we just saw. It also has about 150,000 stars. And, uh, uh, you know, if you take a look through an amateur telescope, this is pretty much what you would see with a, something like a six inch or eight inch telescope, um, except you'd be outside and it'd be kind of probably a little bit cold right now because uh, it's uh, getting into fall. Other than that, I'll turn it back over to John. Thank you very much, Randy. That's great. Okay, now we have a special treat for you tonight that well, we thought we may or not have. Actually, whoops. Oh, uh, no? yes, we actually have, uh, we have uh, two quick questions. So okay. one uh, from Zachary uh, Vahidi, um, and I believe that question uh, is directed to Franco. What makes the water on Mars salty? That's a great question. And since this information is very, very still new, it's not 100% certain as to the, uh, the water, the underground lakes that we found in Mars using uh, the Mars Advanced Radar for Subsurface and Ionosphere Sounding, also uh, acronymized to MARSIS. Um, we aren't entirely sure yet, but the idea is that, <clears throat> that the reason why these lakes survived even this long is 
partially, they think it's due to the fact that they may have formed after some underground volcanic activity warmed the area up around a million years ago. As the temperature dropped, natural salts dissolved in the water may have kept it from freezing, just like road salt keeps water from becoming ice. And But this isn't the same kind of table salt that we're used to when we like, you know, want to spice up our, uh, our foods, although salt isn't very spicy. Um, the salt is more hypersaline perchlorate brine. So it's not something that, you know, you can kind of just rinse down like a, like an infection when the doctor tells you to, you know, do a, a salt rinse. It's, it's very strong stuff. So that's why I said that it wouldn't be fun to drink the salty water of Mars. Great. Thank you, Franco. And uh, the next question I can take, uh, where can I sign up for the next virtual stargazing? Uh, that is a good question. And thank you for liking our program. Uh, so I will be sending out uh, the survey link. Uh, to you by this Saturday. And in the survey form, you will actually get a chance to sign up for our uh, mailing list. So thank you. And John, getting back to you. All right. So we are kind of running late here tonight, but we, uh, earlier today, we were hoping to be able to show you an image of Mars. And that wound up being sort of difficult because of the clouds and such, but it looks like we now can go live and show you an image of Mars. So again, remember over here in the lower left part of your screen in the eastern sky, there's that beautiful red bright star. And um, that, that we're gonna go back to Jose in his backyard observatory here in Moreno Valley and see what he's got to show us. So Jose, what do you got? All right, all right. Thank you for having me back. And I'm gonna see if I can show you uh, a live view of Mars, it is in the great, it is not the great by any means, but it's uh, something that you can actually look at and you can actually see dark areas of the planet um, right here. Uh, again, uh, I'm looking through a little bit of uh, atmosphere turbulence and some uh, thin clouds, but you can actually make up dark areas in the center of the planet uh, and then you can see some bright areas on the on the edges outside. Now I don't have the camera properly aligned north, south, east, or west, so uh, I cannot make out exactly where is the north or the uh, south pole here is. And there is much detail, but I wanted to uh, at least have the chance of showing you guys what it looks like uh, from my point of view here in Moreno Valley, and. Uh, if it was a little bit higher, yes, we could probably have a little bit less uh, turbulence to go through here. And probably next month uh, is going to be rising up a lot earlier than this month. And it will uh, show a better uh, image, even though it will not be as close as it is to us as it is tonight. Uh, John? All right. So it's about time to wrap things up here tonight. We've been going for a while and we've... Uh... It's getting a little late for folks. Um, so we do want to wrap things up. Um, very briefly, I want to put in a little plug for uh, my astronomical society that we've uh, talked a little bit about. Yeah. And there's some, some of the resources we can go to uh, if you want to learn more about astronomy. A couple of excellent books, Night Watch by Terrence Dickinson. It's really a good book for your high school students and adults, all about the hobby and science of John, astronomy. Not seeing I it. don't think we're seeing, seeing your oh, screen. Oh, hold on. I'm gonna start again. All right, I don't know what happened there. Thank you. Better? Here you go, yeah. We see the whole screen, we don't All see. right, so some excellent. Uh, John, we cannot see, there you go. So we have A Child's Introduction to the Night Sky by Michael Driscoll, an excellent book for maybe elementary school children, all about the science and hobby of astronomy. Night Watch by Terrence Dickinson is more for adults. Excellent view, excellent book. A couple of magazines you might want to think about if you want to keep up with the latest developments in astronomy. Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Magazine. Pick those up at Border, at, excuse me, Barnes & Noble. Um, some uh, websites, skymaps.com. You can go there every month and download an excellent updated map of the sky. And Sky Safari, terrific app for your tablet or your phone. 
And then Stellarium, that's the program I've been using tonight to show you this guy. It's a free download for your computer, or you can go to the website uh, with your Chromebook and just uh, do a web-based program. We also I just want to mention that we do uh, AM from the Riverside Astronomical Society and uh, our, our website, rivastro.org. Um, it's, if, you, you might, if you're interested in astronomy, I want to think about joining a club. And if you think about joining a club, you might want to join our club. Even if you're not from Riverside, you're still welcome to join. Um, Sinan? Yes, thank you, John. And now I am going to um, advertise for uh, the UCR Astro uh, Astronomy Facebook page. So if you just type in uh, Astronomy UC Riverside, Follow us and you will be getting all these uh, upcoming events that we're hosting the, the first moment that we schedule them. So you can see um, we have a lot of events coming up. So uh, yeah, and of course, uh, sign up to be on the email list if you uh, have a chance to fill out the, the survey later. All so, right, so do plan on coming back together again, right? Yes, uh, yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, so we are having our next session in November and on November the 12th, it's uh, again a Thursday and uh, we will be possibly doing binocular astronomy. Again, at 8 p.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Saving Time. Oh, maybe not Daylight Saving, Standard Time by then. So, uh, but still eight and uh, yeah. So I guess um, I'd like to uh, thank everyone again for joining us today. And as mentioned, we would really appreciate your feedback if you could um, kindly fill out the short survey for us um, once you receive that email. So uh, any final thoughts, John? Well, I do. Okay, so I think we're going to look at officially closing down. But for those of you who want to stay for a few minutes, we now have the fourth moon available from... from Remember Galilean moons of which only three were visible? Well, now the fourth one has peeked out from behind Jupiter and man, he's willing to show it to us. So right. if you want to stick, out for, stick around for a few more minutes, that'd be great. But uh, otherwise, we'll see you in November. But right. Manny, want to take All it? All right, very quickly. Wait a minute. Okay, so here we are. Here's our live view of Jupiter. And uh, I'd like to point out, if you see this little uh, thing right here, so this was not visible before because uh, this is the what is called the Great Red Spot on uh, on Jupiter, and so this is a long-lived storm that was discovered uh, back in the 1600s when the telescope was first invented, uh, and it, that storm is still going strong. Uh, it has gotten smaller in the last. Uh, a few decades, but uh, I thought it's kind of cool that the, the planet has now rotated sufficiently to uh, to show us the great red spot. So I'm going to increase the exposure just a little bit here. And we're going to blow out the planet, but now what you see here ah, there it is. is another new moon. This is the moon uh, Callisto, which has just uh, popped out. I think I may have uh, said it wrong before. It uh, uh, th saying that it was Ganymede, but this is this is in fact uh, the moon Callisto, and this is Io, which we saw before. I would have to zoom out further, and you could see that the other two uh, Galilean moons are are down here. I go quickly. Uh, okay, that freaked out the camera. Just a moment. Let's see if it's gonna. Okay, here we go. And so now, there we can see Io, Callisto, Europa and Ganymede. All four of the Galilean moons have now made their appearance. Back to you, John. All right, that was great. Uh, thanks for sticking with that, Manny, to be able to show it to us and whoever is still sticking around watching, glad you did. And I hope to see you all. Do we have any questions we wanna take before we uh, close things down, Sinan? Um, I guess there's just a quick question asking about the link for the November stargazing. Um, I guess as long as you either follow us on, on the uh, Facebook page or you sign up for our emailing list or, uh, you know, whichever way you know about our current event, you will always be hearing from us uh, for the upcoming events. So, 
And I just want to mention, if you have missed our prior few different uh, events, those are available to, to watch on YouTube. You can go ahead and search for those and see what you missed. Or if you saw them, yes. you want to see them again. Otherwise, that's a good point. Again. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Thank uh, you for joining us tonight. Point.